And we bring tonight a man who recently returned after a lengthy stay in the southern part of Africa, a Southern Californian who was a graduate of Stanford University. He even played football on the Stanford team when they called them the Indians. He is probably the most widely read conservative author today. He's written 104 articles for American Opinion, 140 articles for American Opinion magazine. And sometimes I think the magazine just wouldn't be the same if it weren't for an article by Gary Allen. He's written eight books. He's invaded, without permission, the backgrounds of the Rockefellers, of Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, and even Jimmy Carter before he was elected to the presidency of the United States of America. He will soon complete a new book called The Kennedy Capers. And I don't suppose we have to identify which Kennedys have been capering about lately. His none dare call it conspiracy has sold more than four million copies. He has marched with the rabble in Berkeley, and he's rubbed elbows with the elite in New York. And two weeks ago, ex returned to Southern California from that extensive trip in the southern part of Africa. His subject is South Africa, an outlook in South Africa, or as he likes to call his talk, Rhodesia, adio. All of us admire his great talent as a reporter and a writer. And by virtue of his dimensions, none dare call him anything but Sir Gary Allen. <laughs> Mr. Welch, council members, John Birch Society members, guests, giving a formal speech is a totally new experience for me. Those of you who have attended any of my talks know that I normally use only a skimpy outline and talk mostly off the cuff. However, tonight, I am restricted to precisely 20 minutes, at which time Mr. Armour is going to push a button, and I will be summarily dispatched into the nether regions in the bowels of the Century Plaza Hotel. Because of these time limitations, I will tell all of my jokes in Joe Merton's room 607 at the party after the... <laughs> that is after I turned Mr. Welch into the EPA for fouling the air here. Don't laugh, you'll screw up the 20 minutes. <laughs> Regretfully, I must also refrain from making any jokes about my boss, Scott Stanley, the world's greatest editor, corniest orator, and number one wine snob. <laughs> Scott Stanley is the only man I know who asks for the wine list at Pup and Taco. <laughs> so there will be no remarks 
about pygmies, trolls, dwarfs, midgets, munchkins, leprechauns, or, even though we are so close to Hollywood, fairies. Unfortunately, the news that I bring back from Southern Africa is anything but pleasant. The biggest story of the past year comes from Rhodesia and is depressing in the extreme. Just one year ago, your reporter visited Rhodesia. At that time, terrorism was well under control. The terrorists were a problem only in the rural areas. Today, these activities have increased by a factor of 10, and terrorists are likely to strike almost anywhere. South Africa is now loaded with angry ex-Rhodesians who have reluctantly left their homeland, convinced that the situation there is hopeless. There is nothing you can do but shake your head and resist the temptation to cry as they tell their stories. These are magnificent, courageous people who have lost everything and for whom leaving Rhodesia was a wrenching experience. When the body of Rhodesia is sent to the coroner for an autopsy, it won't take Dr. Quincy to discover that the victim was murdered. And you won't have to be Charlie Chan to name the murderers. The names are Kissinger, Vance, Carter, Wilson, and Callahan. Fourteen years ago, Rhodesia made its unilateral declaration of independence from Great Britain in much the same fashion as we Americans made our declaration of independence on July 4, 1776. Rhodesia opted for this course because England was demanding that the colony adopt black majority rule the equivalent of a demand by King George that the colonies of America accede to majority rule by the Indians. Since 24 out of 25 Rhodesians are black, and considering the treatment giving, given whites in other African nations where governments were turned over to black rule, Rhodesia's leaders felt they had no choice. Elsewhere, Great Britain had bid colonies which had desired independence a bon voyage. But in the case of Rhodesia, she led the world in placing economic sanctions on the newly independent country. Because of these sanctions, most nations refused to buy from or sell to the fledgling republic. Despite this, and with the help of South Africa, Rhodesia not only survived, but for many years prospered. Then in 1976, Henry Kissinger met with Rhodesian Prime Minister Ian Smith in Geneva and explained the facts of life of big-time power politics. Kissinger told Smith that the United States would see to it that Rhodesia's oil supplies were shut off if Smith did not agree to black majority rule. On the other hand, if the Rhodesian Premier agreed to do what he had solemnly promised his constituents he never would do, Kissinger would arrange to lift the sanctions. Those who have long followed Smith say that the man aged 10 years during that week in Geneva. Last fall, Ian Smith came to visit America. Obviously agonizing over his country's position, Smith pleaded that he had submitted to Kissinger's demands and that the U.S. had reneged on its half of the bargain. Now, however, black majority rule was not sufficient. Carter, Vance, and company, like Kissinger, closely tied to the Council on Foreign Relations Trilateral Commission Complex, had simply upped the ante, demanding that Smith agree to bring into the government the very communist terrorists that Rhodesia had been fighting for a decade. This is the equivalent of asking Rhodesia to slash its own throat. The insiders clearly want a communist Rhodesia so that the pressure can then be put on the real target, neighboring South Africa. 
No reasonable person could expect the Rhodesians to bring the communist terrorists into the government without precipitating a bloodbath. Jimmy Carter knows this, and so do the brave people of Rhodesia. The alternative is economic strangulation supported by protracted terrorism. What is life like today in Rhodesia? In a word, grim. The backbone of that brave country has been its tremendously productive agricultural community, which is by far the most modern and advanced in Africa. Farming provides 50% of Rhodesia's gross national product. It is Rhodesia's agricultural exports which have allowed the country to survive over the past decade. Now, large, irrigated, highly mechanized farms are being abandoned by the hundreds as 85% of the nation is under effective control of the terrorists at nightfall. Rhodesia simply cannot survive as an economic unit without the foreign exchange earned by its agriculture. Ian Smith's acceptance of black majority rule and continuing demands by the United States and Britain that the terrorists of the so-called patriotic front be brought into the government have now convinced the terrorists that they are going to win. Blacks who were formerly on the fence are jumping onto what they see as the winning side. And believe me, in Africa, you don't want to be on the losing side of such a war. Farms there now resemble the frontier forts of our Old West. The gardens in the main house are surrounded by security fences, often up to 15 feet high. Many of them have additional security arrangements so that anyone who touches the fence will set off an alarm system. All have a series of arc lights within the security fences which are electronically controlled from the house. Many of the homes are surrounded by a trellis upon which ivy or bougainvillea are growing. On closer inspection, the trellis turns out to be steel mesh, always in direct line with the windows to deflect any rockets that might get through the security fence. Some farmers have a machine gun mounted on the roof in a turret. Around the outer limits of the security fences, other farmers have planted electronically controlled landmines, which can be set off from inside the farmhouse. There is no more sitting on the veranda in the cool of the evening, reflecting upon the hard work of the day as the houseboy brings a gin and tonic. When guests come or leave by the front gate, someone is there to cover the party with a submachine gun. At night, steel shutters are closed over the windows. Guard dogs are turned loose into the compound. The electrical systems are switched on, and the farmer and his family enjoy the evening amenities within the relative safety of their home. But always, automatic weapons are kept inches away, ready to be grabbed at the first unusual noise. This is Rhodesia for 5,800 farmers and their families. There has been nothing like it since the Indian Wars on the American frontier. Nobody tours the roads of Rhodesia now without an automatic weapon at his side. Brave women driving into town, smartly dressed for some social event, carry a Browning submachine gun across their laps. At the time of the interim agreement, Killings by terrorists were running about 180 per month. Now it is nearly a thousand per month. The atrocities are indescribable. Terrorists pry the eyes of their victims out with bayonets. Males are emasculated. Limbs are severed. And victims are often disemboweled. Sometimes wives are forced at gunpoint to consume some part of the flesh of 